The I-70 doubleheader goes to the Royals in convincing fashion. Why the Cardinals could learn a thing or two from what Kansas City did to them on today's crossover episode of Locked on Cardinals and Locked on Royals. You are Locked on Cardinals, your daily St. Louis Cardinals podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Cardinals fans and Royals fans. I'm J.D. Haffron, and I'm a national radio sports anchor, born and raised in the Lou, and a lifetime Cardinals fan. And I'm your host for Locked On Cardinals, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, covering your team every day. You can follow me on Twitter, X, at J.D. Sports Radio, as well as the podcast at LO underscore Cardinals. Representing our brothers from another mother over in Kansas City is Locked On Royals host Jack Johnson, who you can also find on Twitter, X. He's available at Johnny J underscore 15. Uh, we want to thank those of you who make Locked On Cardinals and Locked On Royals your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts, as well as on YouTube. Make sure you guys like, subscribe, and comment and interact with us and hit that notification button so you know when the new episodes are posted. This episode of Locked On Cardinals and Locked On Royals is being brought to you by Booking.com. Booking. Yeah, the right stay can make you a fan of any city, even your rivals. So check out Booking.com for your stay today. All right, we want to welcome in for uh, the Cardinals fans who have never seen Jack before or uh, met Jack. Uh, if you haven't hopped on over to Locked On Royals yet, Jack, welcome in and uh, tell everybody a little bit about yourself and why uh, you're a part of this Locked On Podcast Network. What is it about the Royals that got you involved? Yeah, man, thanks for having me. Um, I was born and raised here in Kansas City and uh, I currently work at our local radio station area, one of them, that Sports Radio 810 WHB, do some hosting, co-hosting, and producing over there. And about, oh, a year ago, around this time, um, I got approached to do this podcast, which I immediately jumped on because um, I would say even more so than, than any of the teams I root for, the Royals have always been front and center to me. I've been a big baseball guy, grew up playing baseball, played it throughout my entire life, and uh, there was no other opportunity that sounded better than this than for coverage of the Royals every single day and that's not always been easy this is <laughs> uncharted territory a little bit over the last half decade um you know last year wasn't as fun as this one's been but you know in baseball it can always change uh, so you can never take that for granted now I've seen a, a couple of games at Kauffman Stadium over over my years and uh Always an, a nice trip over there. Haven't yet got to see a Chiefs game at Arrowhead, which is something I plan on doing at some point in my life. But uh, let's stick to the baseball stuff today. Um, Royal sweep the doubleheader on Wednesday, which, uh, you know, there's supposed to be two games separated, but because of the rain in St. Louis, make it into a doubleheader. And the Royals take it 8-5 and 6-4. to four. Both very entertaining games, which... Uh, I, much to the chagrin of Cardinals fans, both of them go to the Royals, but that was the kind of baseball I like to see. It, it was a, it was good, clean games for the most part. Uh, and you saw action. You saw some good pitching. You saw some bad pitching. You saw some offense. You saw power. You saw some stolen bases. Like there was a lot going on in this series, which made it uh, actually a lot of fun to watch despite the final score for the Cardinals side of things. Um, in my opinion, just watching it, uh, the Royals, just look like a better all-around baseball team. I want to start with game one here. What were your takeaways from what you saw, considering, you know, the Cardinals jump out to that three to nothing lead, and, you know, and everybody in, in St. Louis were like, we got this. Big Brother's going to take this one. And then the Royals, I mean, really show no quit and end up jumping back into things and, uh, you know, run away with it, actually, in game one. And I was texting you, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. It was like I, it kind of caught me off guard that the Royals were able to to come back in this one. What were your thoughts about how they were able to react after being down three to nothing? Yeah, pretty shocking. I think against a team like St. Louis and on the road, I mean, from time to time this year, the Royals had shown that tenacity in coming back. They had a an eight-run deficit get erased in a game against Seattle, and that was their most notorious comeback this year. And a couple other times, one being against San Diego, they were down 11-3 to in the ninth inning, and Nelson Velasquez had a ball that died at the wall that would have tied the game. So they had shown this year they can come back from three-run deficits, four-run deficits, and eight- and nine-run deficits at times. But it had been a while since they had done that, and especially on the road. I mean, they were coming off 
a series in Colorado in which they scored three runs in the first two games of that series against Kyle Freeland and Austin Gomber. So it wasn't like they were rolling in hot uh, to this series. And I had wondered with the back-to-back off days, Monday being a traditional off day, and then Tuesday getting rained out in St. Louis, you know, was it just being flat, right? It's a day game. It's a doubleheader. You know, Alec Marsh hadn't been great over his last six to seven starts. And you know, it was the third inning. And the Royals have one hit, and it was kind of a, a bloop by Hunter Renfro. I didn't have much confidence at this point. But as I said, with the comeback portion of this team, when they strike, they strike like that. Like it's three to nothing, and all of a sudden it's four to three. It's not a three to nothing, then three to one, then three to two, then four to two, then four to four. It's pretty suddenly, and the runs come in bunches. I, I mean, they can really kind of have the 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 train start when it's just, you know, kind of like what they did in 14 and 15, just single, 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 one guy, you know, clears the bases with the double. And, and I think that was the perfect game they needed in game one, because the Cardinals, of course, as you are very aware of, been one of the best teams in the national league of late. So it wasn't like they caught somebody at a great time. They were playing poorly. That's kind of all the things that came together is why I wasn't too confident, but in baseball, you never really know. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, starting pitch for the Royals, Alec Marsh. You know, the Cardinals jump on him with a couple of dingers, and it looks like things are going to spiral out of control. And then all of a sudden, he just locks in, and I believe it was 15 in a row at one point that uh, the Cardinals' batters were retired. Did you notice anything that he was doing differently or that the Cardinals' hitters were doing differently, that all of a sudden it just was a, a complete 180 where it looked like they were seeing and smashing everything to just nothing, and he just shut him down. There was one start I remember this year from Alec Marsh. He gave up one hit over seven shutout innings against the Yankees. And in those final three innings he was out there against St. Louis, it looked a lot like that, where you know the hitters were helping him out a little bit. He's got a firm fastball, and he's got a pretty good sweeper and a curveball he likes to use in two-strike counts. Nolan Arenado pounded one of the curveballs that stayed up in the zone earlier. And that to me is when he spirals, which is why when it was three to nothing, I'm going, when he gets tagged early, it's going to start spiraling in the fourth and fifth and sixth inning. And you kind of hope he can save the bullpen a little bit because you still had one other game that night. So what changed for me, I thought he was a lot more aggressive and almost looked like he pitched a little bit more comfortably. Like it was a three nothing deficit. It's Hey, at this point, my focus is on keeping this team in the game rather than holding on to a lead. Maybe he had confidence that the offense was going to turn things on at one point, but you could see him pitching with a lot more confidence. He was living in the zone. He was setting up those two strike pitches low and away that was getting Cardinal uh, hitters to swing at it. And that's when he's going well. He can get seven, eight, nine strikeouts every other outing or so, but it'd been a long time since he'd done that because I thought in his last three or four, he was nibbling a lot, falling behind 2-0, falling behind 2-1. And we saw that in the first three innings of this, but after he fell behind 3-0, he got that aggressive mentality back and started to pound the zone a little bit more. Yeah, and you could say the exact opposite about what happened on the Cardinals side with Andre Palante, who comes out dealing and through four innings, you're like, all right, here we go. Palante shutting it down. And then in the fifth inning, things just kind of blow up in his face. And you go and you look back at the box score now, and you see the Palante lasted six in the third innings and Marsh last six. But when uh, it started the way it did, you didn't think that that was going to be the case, that Marsh was going to be long gone long before uh, Palante was. And um, you, you mentioned Marshy striking people out, 8Ks uh, against the Cardinals, only five for Palante, and it, it's something that I noticed uh, about the Royals' offense, which it, it's something that I, I've harped on about the Cardinals all year, is the strikeouts are just maddening. The The amount of strikeouts that the Cardinals hitters will put up each and every day. And I understand that sometimes you know pitchers are just good, and you're going to strike out against these guys. But something that I did take away from those two games was the Royals put the ball in play a lot more than they than they strike out, and it leads to a lot of good things happening. You know, you saw a lot of sack flies. You saw people getting moved over in uh, the right situations. And on the other side of things, you see the Cardinals 
striking out in situations like that. And it's been a problem for them this year with runners in scoring position that they, they just don't put the ball in play enough. Uh, Nolan Gorman and Paul Goldschmidt, who are two of the big thumpers in the Cardinals lineup, strike out nine times yesterday. Nine in the two games. <laughs> like, that's just something that you, you just cannot have. In especially about two guys that are, you know, in major positions in your lineup, uh, Paul Goldschmidt batting cleanup. I mean, Cardinal fans were killing him yesterday. Like, why is he still in the four hole? What are we doing? This guy keeps striking out left and right. He's on a, on pace to set a way new high for, for his career in strikeouts uh, for the season. So um, something maybe Ollie's going to tinker with down the road. And, uh, you know, he did it with Arenado where he moved him down in the lineup to number six. And uh, maybe that's something that'll happen with Paul Goldschmidt. So uh, we'll find out. I want to talk more about game two. I want to talk about where these teams go from here. And of course, we're going to get into some trade deadline talk with both teams in playoff contention. So uh, I want to get some uh, thoughts on what Jack thinks the, the Royals might do with the trade deadline. So we're going to get into all of that on this Locked On Cardinals, Locked On Royals crossover episode. Remember the first day of school or, say, the first day at a new job, and you'd be wearing that, that brand new outfit that you picked out, and, you know, you, you're feeling all good about yourself. You got some confidence as you walk in through those doors. Well, did you know that you can get that instant confidence boost back with our friends at Stitch Fix? And get this, Stitch Fix is going to give you a stylist. Jack, we get stylists from Stitch Fix. They're going to hook us up. That way we don't have to make the decisions because clearly – if we need Stitch Fix, your, your taste probably not that good. So uh, they're going to help you out. They take in consideration your style. They're going to take into consideration your size, whether you're, you're a larger person or smaller person, thin, whatever it may be, muscular. Uh, also your budget, which is very important. And then they're going to do the shopping for you. They're going to pick out all the stuff that you uh, they think you're going to like. They'll browse it for you, and then you make a decision on whether or not you want them. You can order things when you want and how you want with no subscription required. And with summer here, obviously uh, a different level of clothing, humidity in the Midwest, in Missouri, between Kansas City and St. Louis. We're all familiar with it. So uh, make sure you upgrade your closet sensibly with our friends at Stitch Fix. And if you don't love something, you can send it back. Shipping returns and exchanges, they're always free. So style that makes you feel as you look. Now's the best time to get started at stitchfix.com slash MLB. They're going to give you $100 off. That's $25 off. Your first four fixes for a limited time only. That's stitchfix.com slash MLB for $100 off. Stitchfix.com slash MLB must redeem within seven days of sign up. Offer does not include kids' fixes. Here on Locked on Cardinals and Locked on Royals, we pride ourselves in giving you the latest news for your team, whether we're talking about the offseason, uh, the MLB draft. It's coming up here real soon. Spring training, obviously, very important. Playoffs, which uh, both of our teams are in contention for. We're going to get to that here momentarily, but it's year round, right? So you know what else is year round? Sadly, is collection season. Just because tax season is over doesn't mean the IRS just goes away, sits on the sidelines until tax season starts up next time around. No, they keep coming. The IRS can garnish your wages. They can levy your bank accounts and even seize your property. So don't let the IRS target you. Just let the licensed professionals and tax experts at Tax Network USA, go to bat for you. Now, I've got multiple jobs. I'm sure Jack's got plenty of them. We're both in the radio business as well. So uh, we've got probably some, some unique tax situations, different amounts coming and going from different spots. Uh, so it, it gets confusing. And that's where uh, a place like Tax Network USA can come into play for you with over 14 years of experience and an A-plus rating by the Better Business Bureau. Tax Network USA has saved their clients over $1 billion in tax debt. So whether you owe the taxes, whether you got complicated matters that require more tax planning, what if you're somebody who likes to do the gambling and you finally hit that parlay this season, you need help correctly filing. So don't get in trouble with them for that. Call 1-800-549-1000 or visit tnusa.com slash locked on and be sure to mention locked on Cardinals or locked on Royals at checkout and you'll receive a $250 discount off their services.
Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day and have to turn down the volume because of all of the shouting? Well, then make that switch to Locked on Sports today. It's a free 24-7 sports streaming channel, and it's programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked on Sports today brings you can't miss analysis. You'll get the opinions. you get the news. Streaming 24-7 on YouTube. So no matter what your schedule is, it'll be there for you. Or you can also find it on the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day a reminder you can catch every pitch of the cardinals hometown broadcast as their uh their their homestand continues this weekend against the cubbies with sirius xm just download the sxm app and search the word cardinals and thank you for making locked on cardinals and locked on royals your first listen every day leave your comments on youtube as well as on twitter x anytime you want that feedback always welcome and encouraged i'm jd haffer from locked on cardinals we got jack johnson from locked on royals Talking about game two of this series where, uh, once again, Cardinals show a little pop early on. Lars Newbar just coming back from the IL, hits the home run, and uh, Cardinals are off and running. You're thinking, all right, we're, here we go again. All right, we're, we're fine. And then the Royals are like, stop it, stop it. And uh, they just kind of take off with things. I can tell you this much. Whatever the game plan is against Salvador Perez for the Cardinals, stop it. Rip it up. Throw it away. It sucks. It's terrible. He's amazing, and I get that, but holy crap. I mean, the bomb he hit in game two, I don't know if it landed over in your neck of the woods, Jack, or what, because that our left fielder, Brendan Donovan, had no idea where it went. It went so far over the concourse. Like, just an absolute bomb. Tell me what it's like having a guy, a thumper like Salvador Perez, at this point in his career, still doing the things that he's doing. Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of the main reasons why the Royals are eight games over 500. I mean, they're five games off of where their total was last year. It's one of the biggest turnarounds that, you know, we've seen here in Royals history. And yeah, Bobby Witt Jr., Seth Lugo, Cole Reagans, they're going to get the talk, right? But Salvador Perez kind of drank from the fountain of youth. I mean, he's a 34-year-old catcher. I've always brought up that you know, his size, like in the end, was going to deteriorate his play. I mean, he's six foot four, 250, 260 pounds. It's hard to go behind the plate every single day at that size. And the Royals know that a little bit, and they've moved him to first base from time to time. But I go back to 2019. He missed the entire year with Tommy John surgery. And then he had the COVID year, which only played 37 games of the 60. That, to me, is why he's able to have this offensive resurgence late in his career because he had almost two years off. I mean, he had a year and a half at least off, only getting 37 games over two years. It allowed him to rest his body, and now we can see in hopefully a playoff push, a Salvador Perez that we had been hoping to see the last you know handful of years. 2021, he had the 48 home run season. But he had had a couple of down years and also years where he missed a lot of playing time. And to put him in the four hole to, you know, find that power again, I'm still in awe that, you know, at his age, I mean, 34 is not that old, but, you know, 34 year olds aren't really hitting 450 foot bombs at 112 (laughs) miles an hour that much. So as a Royals fan, I mean, he's going to have a statue out of Kauffman Stadium one day. He's one of the most beloved Royals of all time. And To see him still play like this, to get the nod of the All-Star game, it's a really cool thing here. I mean, yeah, Bobby Wood Jr., we love to see the future of this team, but to have the past and the present and the future with this team, you know, Salvador Perez being a big part of that, it's awesome to see. Yeah, and specifically after, you know, last year was a a terrible year for for both of our teams, but there was a lot of chatter that, is it time for the Royals to move on from Salvador Perez? Should they trade him now while well, he's got some uh, some worth left? And what does he do this year? He just comes out and mashes. And it, it, it's one of those cool things as somebody from an outsider's perspective to, to see a guy, you know, we had Yadier Molina all those years behind the plate for the Cardinals and, you know, never went anywhere else. And it would be odd to go see Salvador Perez at some point getting moved on from Kansas City. So, As a baseball fan, it's great to see the Royals progressing and getting better. That way, we don't have to see Salvador Perez wearing pinstripes or in a Dodgers uniform, wherever, you know, whoever was going to try to pilfer him out of Kansas City. Uh, It's nice to see him. I hate that he's crushing the Cardinals, but when you guys kill everybody else, it's uh, 
you know, it, it's good to see. It's something that, uh, you know, you miss in baseball the, the, the around this time when we're talking trade deadline and stuff. And you see a lot of these guys, they just they don't stick around with the same cities and the same teams anymore. So Salvi to still be doing what he's doing in Kansas City, I think, is a is a good thing for Major League Baseball. Uh, a guy that's worn a couple of different uniforms, including the Cardinals, was your starter yesterday and Michael Waka in game two. Uh, thoughts on Michael Waka? Because. On the Cardinals side of things, uh, you know, because people were like, oh, look at Waka owning the Cardinals. And I, I didn't see it that way. I, I thought they hit Waka pretty good. And there were a lot of balls that just kind of died at the warning track. That might have been home runs in a lot of different ballparks. I saw a lot of line drives just going right at other Royals players. And it, it seemed like there was a little bit of bad luck going on for the Cardinals. But what were your thoughts on what Michael Waka showed you yesterday? and how you feel about him overall this season with the Kansas City Royals. Yeah, Waka uh, was not missing many bats yesterday. So anybody that thought that he was carving up the Cardinals, I just, I don't know what game you're watching. Because, yeah, <laughs> he did get, you know, 15 outs in the game. Uh, they were loud. <laughs> Those yeah. 15 outs were very loud. And there was a lot of times that I thought the ball was going to leave the yard. I, uh, one of my good buddies, David Lesky, uh, who covers the Royals well, he had brought up a stat last night of like balls that were hit over 350 feet. And I'll just say there were a lot of balls that were hit <laughs> over 350 feet. And, you know, it, it was surprising because Michael Walker has been fantastic over his last seven or eight starts. He's having a you know carbon copy you know, 2000 or comparison to his 2023 season in which in April wasn't very good. ERA was in the high five fives. And then he had like seven to eight, maybe nine starts in a row where it was just pumping out quality start after quality start. His velo was up. Even last night, he had 95 and 96 a few times. He's been a fantastic addition to the Royals rotation, and which is why they're second in the American League in quality starts this year. Because, you know, Seth Lugo, every time he takes the ball, he's going six innings, and he's likely keeping teams at three runs or less. Cole Reagans is kind of your wow factor when you throw 98, 99, 100 with a wipeout curveball, wipeout changeup. You know, that's going to be the eye catcher. But Michael Walker has been very steady. And when he was out for uh, about three or four starts and the Royals had to go with Daniel Lynch, it was noticeable. It was very noticeable the lack of depth this team has in the rotation. And even losing a guy like Michael Walker, who hasn't been lighting up, I think he's been a very good number three in this rotation. Mm -hmm. But when you lose that number three, especially in Kansas City, there's not a, another good arm to throw in there and just keep the pace. Like that's, I think the biggest concern is if the Royals lose one of those top four starters for the rest of the year, an extended period, they don't have the depth to just go and eat those innings in the way that these guys have been able to. And that leads me to what we're going to be seeing from both of our teams here in the future. We got the trade deadline coming up here in less than a month now. And um, it seems like, a lot of teams that are in playoff contention are kind of in the same spot. We're all kind of looking for the same stuff, but uh, I, I want to get your thoughts on what you think the, the Royals might target coming up here at the trade deadline. Who are some names maybe that you got your eye on and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll mix and match and see if there's uh, something going on where maybe the Cardinals and Royals get into a, to a bidding war for, for some of these guys. So uh, we'll talk more about the futures of these two teams and what they might do at the trade deadline Coming up next on this Locked on Cardinals, Locked on Royals crossover. This episode of Locked on Cardinals and Locked on Royals being brought to you by Booking.com. Booking. Yeah, with summer travel heating up, especially travel for baseball games. It's time to explore those U.S. cities that you always secretly wanted to learn more about. And yes, we're even talking about the rival cities when on the Royal side, you're obviously Cleveland, Minnesota. I don't really call the White Sox a, a rival anymore, but uh, you got Detroit in the mix. Obviously, on the Cardinal side of things, Wrigley Field with Chicago. You're talking Milwaukee, Cincinnati, and Pittsburgh. And these are some really nice cities, despite how you feel about those teams. The cities and the stadiums and the areas surrounding them, they're a lot of fun when you're talking about Kauffman Stadium. Uh, obviously, some great stuff to go on in, that goes on in Kansas City if you've never visited there. And um, with hotels, bed and breakfast, you know, vacation rentals, resorts, and so much more, all of this available on Booking.com. So you can go see your favorite stadiums and your teams play in those ballparks and in those cities 
with Booking.com. You just might find your perfect stay, even in your baseball's rival city. Booking.com has so many choices across the U.S. for your summer travel this MLB season. And let's not forget, parents, Little League tournaments. Jack, you were talking earlier. You've been playing baseball all your life, same way for me. And you go on these tournaments, and you're constantly in different cities and different hotels, and mom and dad are paying for it all, and they got to book all this stuff. And Booking.com can become very, very useful for situations like that as well. So the right stay can make you a fan of any U.S. city even your rival. So book today on booking.com on the site, or you can go into the booking.com app. Now going to baseball games in St. Louis and Kansas city, it's tradition. And when you want to make that trek to ballpark village and then Bush stadium to cheer on the Cardinals, or you want to go to Kauffman stadium to see the Royals. When you need tickets to these games, you got to look no further than game the Game Time app. I, I don't know why else you would be looking anywhere else. Game Time app is what I use. It's what got me in the second row for the series against the Reds just a, a week ago, uh, and at very minimal cost compared to what they were going to cost uh, normally. Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets faster, makes it easier. Prices on the Game Time app they actually go down closer you get to first pitch. They got killer last-minute deals. They got the all-in prices. You can uh, view what your tickets are going to look like. You get the the seat view right there, so you get to know exactly what you're in for when you get there. And they've got the lowest price guarantee. So you got those flash deals where you can save even more with exclusive in-app deals on select seats ahead of the game or event. They got the zone deals where you can save even more when you choose a certain section and let game time choose the seats. Lowest price guarantee or game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry with their game time ticket coverage. So take the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets with game time. Just download the game time app, create an account, use the code locked on MLB. We'll save you some money, $20 off your first purchase. Again, terms apply, create an account, redeem the code. It's locked on MLB, L O C K E D O N M L B. For $20 off, download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Locked on has launched the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel on YouTube. It's also available on Amazon Fire TV and the free Fire TV channels app. Locked on Sports Today is here for you 24 7, covering the top sports stories of the day. With the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league, you can find Locked On Sports today, now available on the Free Fire TV channels app. Jack Johnson from Locked On Royals, J.D. Haffer from Locked On Cardinals. All right, so what's on tap for the Royals? Cardinals got the Cubbies coming in. It's a, a four-game series this week at Bush Stadium. They're going to do a doubleheader on Saturday. Luckily for the Cardinals, they won't have to face Shota Imanaga or Justin Steele. Justin Steele. Uh, set to uh, pitch against the Orioles today. Emanaga shut down the Orioles on uh, Wednesday night. So uh, what's on tap for the Royals? Where do you guys go from here? Yeah, one of the biggest series of the year coming up uh, this weekend. They'll be off today. Then they'll head off to Boston to take on the Red Sox at Fenway. And for a lot of Royals fans that have been listening to me, uh, the Red Sox are the team that I think you got to eyeball as for that final wild card spot. Of course, Houston with their playoff pedigree, they're right on the Royals' heels. But you know, they they play later tonight against Oakland, Boston, that is, but they're only a half a game back or ahead of Kansas City in the wild card race. So the Royals yesterday gained one and a half games in about nine hours on the wild card spot because the Red Sox lost. So big time series right before the All Star break. Now, uh, hoping to take two out of three in that one. So the trade deadline at the end of July. And because of the three wild card spots, there are a lot of teams that are still in the mix here. Uh, as much as I know the Royals and the Cardinals, it looks like we're probably pretty safe, but you never know what's going to happen. We still got a, a whole second half of the season to go, but they both look to be buyers at this year's trade deadline, as opposed to what we look like last year when both of us were like, we're terrible. Let's start all over, blow it up, whatever we got to do. Uh, one year later, here we are. And it, it, both teams have made a big turnaround. Uh, Cardinals currently second in the wild card behind the Braves. Uh, they got the Padres on their heels right now. And then the, the Mets have been playing pretty good. Uh, you can't rule out the Diamondbacks just yet. You saw the run they went on last year. So what do you think the Royals are? You mentioned pitching. 
which is something that, you know, everybody wants pitching at the trade deadline. But what is it specifically that you think the Royals are looking for? Because during the telecast yesterday, the, the one thing that they pointed out for Kansas, they were like, if there is kind of an issue with what, what they got going on is maybe they lack a little bit of bullpen depth. But you mentioned starting rotation stuff in case an injury to Waka, who's, you know, had injuries over his career. If he goes down, that there's not a lot of answers there. What are you guys looking for? And who specifically, what are some names that you guys might be looking at? It's got to be bullpen. That, that's that been the, the thing I've harped on for about a month and a half now, where you look at bullpen options, A, they're affordable because the Royals don't have a deep farm system, and B, there's so many relievers out there. I mean, there's guys that are likely available that we don't talk about a lot, and all of a sudden they're going to be dealt to some other team. And that really is the only opportunity I think the Royals can go cash in on getting some help, and they desperately need help in that bullpen. Like, when they had a one-run lead or a two-run lead in the final three innings of game one, and then also last night, you have James MacArthur in the ninth. Other than that, it's kind of a toss-up. Like Will Smith threw in game one. He sometimes throws there. He sometimes doesn't. Angel Serpa threw in game two. He sometimes throws in spots like that. He sometimes doesn't. And the glaring problem with the bullpen has been they don't strike anybody out. So you have a you know situation of a runner at third, one out, yeah, you can bring the infield in, but the Royals don't have anybody that can just go ramp it up at 98, 99, 100, blow somebody away, and then you get out of that inning. So they're going to keep their eye, I believe, on a couple of guys. One name that I've been trying to talk a little bit about because of, I think, the affordability would be kind of in the Royals' wheelhouse is Michael Kopech. He's been bad over the last couple of weeks, but through immaculate inning yesterday against Minnesota, he's got the, the big time swing and miss, can run it up to 100. He could be your eighth inning guy. Maybe he's just not a closer, or maybe he's not pitching well because he's not on a team that's very good. Uh, Carlos Estevez, I know a lot of people are in on. I once thought it'd be an option. I just think there's too many teams, and the Royals certainly aren't going to win many bidding wars, and I kind of lumped Tanner Scott in that same conversation. Yeah. Uh, but you could look to Oakland as well. They've got Austin Adams down there that could be affordable. Lucas Ersig is another guy I've brought up a few times, so – those five or six names, I think the Royals are trying to keep their eye on. But if it comes down to seven or eight teams being interested, they're not going to outbid any of those other six teams. Yeah, and it's a similar spot for the Cardinals where, you know, you see the the, the big markets, you know, uh, you know, Kansas City considered smaller than St. Louis. Obviously, payroll, you can see Cardinals are willing to spend a little bit more than the Royals ever do. But, you know, even the Cardinals are kind of like a, a smaller fish in the big pond when it comes to, you know, Atlanta, the Phillies, the Yankees, the Mets, the Dodgers, you know, all these guys. It seems like they can come in and just take whatever they want from anybody they want. You know, I'm hearing the Phillies are like, well, if the Cubs are going to sell, we'll bring in Cody Bellinger. And I'm like, what the hell, man? <laughs> I was like, we got to add belly to the lineup that's already got all of those stars in Philadelphia. Like, that's not fun. So the Royals and the Cardinals are both kind of in a similar situation where, all right, so the top tier guys we're probably not going to get because of the fact we're not going to outbid anybody. We aren't going to take on some serious contract for anybody else. And our farm systems at this point, there's not enough ammo in them to go and make that big splash to go get like a Garrett Crochet instead of a Kopech from the White Sox. We just don't have it in us to, to, to give up what it would likely take to go get somebody like that. So we do have to nibble a little bit. And, uh, you know, you mentioned Tanner Scott from the Marlins, and that's somebody that obviously the big boys are going to be chasing down him too since he's got an expiring contract in Miami. Uh, Miami's got some other names. Uh, the Washington Nationals got some names that uh, we've talked about on the show before. Uh, guys like uh, a Hunter Harvey or a Dylan Floro. Some of those guys that that's more of the wheelhouse of where I think our two franchises uh, we'll be at, uh, you mentioned some guys in Oakland that, that maybe you can find a nice deal on because we don't know what the hell they're doing. They're going to be playing in Sacramento the next couple. Of, I, I mean, who knows what they're trying to do with uh, the guys they got on that roster. But um, I, I feel like the Royals and the Cardinals are going to be fishing in the same areas. And so it might come down to uh, what either squad is willing to give up to uh, improve this team as they uh, head towards that trade deadline. How about bats real quick? Do you have any bats that you guys uh, might need, or do you think you guys will stand packed barring any injuries? I think the one thing uh, that would really help this lineup out is having a consistent leadoff hitter. Uh, that's really come to fruition over the last 
you know, month or two is because Michael Garcia, who I'm very high on, just isn't a stereotypical leadoff hitter. He doesn't get on base at a high clip. Uh, he's not been working the count as deep into games. He's not hitting for, you know, any power anymore. I mean, he's kind of become this singles guy, but not many singles are still showing up in the box score. I mean, he's just, he's had some really, really bad stretches. So the idea has popped up of, can you go out there and acquire a leadoff hitter? You know, Jazz Chisholm was mentioned uh, a few days ago when the Royals would be one of those teams that are interested. I don't think they had the capital to do that. I know Jazz <laughs> Chisholm's not going to cost the world, but the Royals have one top 100 prospect in a couple of the other rankings, and it's Blake Mitchell, and he's still like, I think, 92 or 93, if I'm not mistaken. So it's going to take more than that. Another name, kind of going back to the White Sox, Tommy Pham. He's yeah. been leading off for them this year, uh, 36 years old, expiring contract. He feels like he could be affordable just because he's only played in 50 to 60 games this year. He's played well enough. I think he'd pencil in well as a leadoff hitter. But I've also had a lot of Royals fans tell me they don't want him in the clubhouse. They they don't <laughs> they don't want him punching players because of fantasy football or trying to start fights. But hey, don't reason, don't try to make sh shady trades. He won't bother you. you then. <laughs> there you go. Don't try to cross him. And hey, maybe some teams. There's a reason he's been on a lot of playoff teams because yeah. you know, Arizona last year they go out and acquire him. Maybe they don't make as deep of run if Tommy Pham's not on that team. The 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 overall numbers are never going to jump off the page, but I think some of the underlying metrics and yeah. what he can bring from the leadoff spot could be perfect for the Royals and also perfectly affordable. Yeah, yeah. And that, that, again, that's uh, another name that the Cardinals fans uh, have, have thought about too. You know, we're thinking about guys like a Tommy Pham, like a, a Kevin Pillar from uh, from the Angels. These are some of the guys. This is the, the type of tier of player that our teams are going to be looking at. And there's a few of us out there that uh, are going to be like, all right, you guys can go bid for these, those big names and we'll be down here. We'll find some, uh, some pieces to just kind of add to the puzzle of what we hope is a, uh, is, is a playoff team. So um, it's going to be a fun couple of weeks heading towards the deadline as some teams fall off, some other ones keep going. And hopefully for both of us, our teams continue to uh, go into the right direction, despite what you guys did to the Cardinals yesterday. So, uh, either way, it was uh, it was a fun day. Unfortunately, it was all in one day, but it was fun to see the Royals again, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to hopefully seeing you guys succeed down the line in, into the playoffs. And uh, you know, for everything that goes on with the Royals, make sure you guys are following uh, Jack. He's available at Johnny J underscore fifteen. What's the fifteen stand for? You know, this is going to sound so cheesy, but when I created that Twitter like years ago, I, my name's so basic, I needed a, a default name. So they just gave me the options. I clicked the first one. And so that, that 15 is just kind of random. And I tried to change it a couple years after that. And it was too late at that point. So I always tell people it was it was computer generated, this name. I wasn't trying to be uh, creative or anything. See, we got to come up with something better than that. We got to be like, that's how many left-handed grand slams you hit in your baseball career. Something like that. You got to come up with something. I can lie a little bit. I can move <laughs> Well, thank you guys for making Locked on Cardinals and Locked on Royals your first listen every day. Again, uh, if you haven't given us a follow here at the Cardinals uh, channel, uh, you can follow us on Twitter, X at LO underscore Cardinals, and me at JD Sports Radio. Again, Jack, it's uh, Johnny J underscore 15. Please like and subscribe on YouTube and help our channels grow. Uh, enjoy your race towards the trade deadline. I'm sure uh, we'll all chit chat again here very, very soon uh, when we have one of those trade deadline shows talking about what we've added, what we've subtracted, where we're going from here. So should be a lot of fun. So thanks for, uh, thanks for hanging out today, Jack. Hey, anytime. And I'm looking forward to doing this again. All right. And thank you guys for being a part of the lockdown podcast network, your team every day.